Welcome back to this course of uh, crystallography. In the previous lecture, we have learnt about the experimental aspects of single crystal X-ray diffraction data collection, how to carry out the experiment and what are the parameters that one needs to worry about. So in today's lecture, we are initially first going to learn a few things regarding the extra diffraction methodologies theories and we will again go back to Lawe's experiment and Lawe's understanding of extra diffraction and then how Bragg's understanding improved the concept of extra diffraction. In about 1920-1913, Lawe's analysis was based on the understanding of a lattice as a three-dimensional network of rows of atoms acting as a three-dimensional grating. So he considered that each one of these atoms arranged in a specific row along X, Y and Z, each of them diffract X-rays in the same way and he derived a few equations explaining those X-ray diffraction coming out of those rows of elements or atoms which he assumed to form a three-dimensional grating. In comparison, William Lawrence Bragg, the son Bragg considered the crystal to be layers or planes of atoms acting as reflecting surface of X-rays. So considering those atoms instead of a row of atom, he considered those rows of atoms form a particular plane and two such parallel planes cause diffraction just like reflection and he derived a very simple equation. So in his understanding some strong diffraction occurs when reflected beams have path difference equal to the integral multiple of wavelength. Although this oversimplification is not fully correct in physical sense as planes of atoms do not actually reflect X-rays as such but it is correct in geometrical sense and hence this understanding is widely accepted and as we all know the mathematical expression for Bragg's law is n lambda equal to 2 dh kl sin theta where Lambda is the wavelength of radiation used, d is the distance between the in two parallel set of planes and theta is the angle of diffraction. So now let us try to understand the concept using Lawe's analysis and we would try to arrive at the Lawe equations of X-ray diffraction. As I said already, in Lawe's understanding the crystal was considered to be a row of atoms at equal spacing along x, y and z. So here I am considering one direction only and the distance between the two lattice points is nothing but a along the direction of x. Now if I assume that the incident radiation is falling on this atom two set two reflect two incident beams falling on two consecutive atoms like this and they make an angle of alpha 0 with x direction and the diffracted beam goes like that. So the diffracted beam makes an angle alpha n with respect to the direction of x rays, sorry with respect to the x direction. So what he considered is the incident beam as S0 where S0 is the unit vector 
along the direction of incident radiation or incident beam and S as the unit vector along the direction of the diffracted beam. And as I have already indicated, A is the translational vector along x from one point to the other. So, with the consideration of a row of atoms located at unit vectorial distance A on x axis along x axis, they are being radiated by an x ray of a particular wavelength and that particular x ray is termed as a 0 indicating the it is unit vector along the direction of the beam and s is the unit vector along the direction of the diffracted beam. So, now if we try to see what is the path difference between the incident beam and the diffracted beam, we would like to drop perpendicular from this point on to the other incident radiation. So, if this particular point is named as A and this is named as C, this AC is perpendicular to the incident beam. Similarly, from the point D, we are dropping another perpendicular on the diffracted beam as db. Remember the angle here is alpha n. So, now between these two parallel beams with unit vectors s0 for the incident beam and s for the diffracted beam, the path difference is equal to a b minus c d, right. And to have a diffraction coming out of these two spots, two atom positions located at A and D, this path difference should be integral multiple of wavelength and when we are talking about this in terms of in, in the direction of x axis, we term it as n x into lambda. So, now by simple geometric means, we would, we can write the path difference where a b is equal to a dot s and c d is equal nothing but a dot s 0 in vector notations. So, we can write this path difference equal to a b minus c d as a cos alpha n minus cos alpha 0 
where alpha n and alpha 0 are the angle of diffracted beam with respect to x and alpha 0 is the angle of the incident beam with respect to x. So, the same can be written in vector notation as a into s minus s 0 which is equal to m x lambda. So, what does it mean? It means that if we have a set of points along the x axis and one such point is irradiated with an x ray of unit vector S0, the direction at which the beam gets diffracted makes a cone of a fixed angle. So, when we have the incident radiation coming at an angle alpha 0, it makes a cone with the angle alpha n for a diffraction. And this is true now in case of all the three directions. So, what happens is that the x-ray diffraction happens in along a cone with respect to a particular direction. So, in the same manner, what we can write are three equations. One is A cos alpha n minus cos alpha 0 equal to nx lambda. Similarly, we can write for y axis B cos beta n minus cos beta 0 equal to n y lambda and C cos gamma n minus cos gamma 0 equal to n z lambda. These three equations are together called the three Lave equations of X-ray diffraction, which eventually means that the X-rays are being diffracted by all the points along X, Y and Z and the incident radiation falls in a particular angle with respect to those axes X, Y and Z and gets diffracted along a cone in all the three directions. So, it means along cones in every direction which actually means the X-ray beam that falls on the crystal diffracts X-ray in all the directions as a cone like this, which actually means that it diffracts in a spherical manner. So, this is how the Lawe's understanding improved the theory of X-ray diffraction when we got three Lawe equations. But you see these three equations are indicating that the directions are to be thought about and then this becomes a cumbersome process to understand diffraction. That is why we now follow Bragg's laws of Bragg's law of X-ray diffraction and let us try to understand the same Bragg's law in vector space or in vector notation. So, in the same manner, let us consider that the X-ray diffraction in the concept of Bragg's is taking place from a particular plane in a crystal. So, this is a particular HKL plane and in that plane the X-ray beam is incident at an angle of theta and it goes it gets reflected from the same angle in the other direction as theta. If we designate this beam with the unit vector S0 and then we designate 
the diffracted beam as unit vector s. So, if we draw a perpendicular on this particular plane and cut that perpendicular at d star h k l that is at 1 by d h k l distance that is the interplanar spacing of this particular plane and then considering this unit vector coming here and then we draw a parallel of unit vector s0 in the opposite direction and draw it as minus s0. So, the unit vector the vector here is nothing but s minus s0. So, what we have once again is s0 is the unit vector along the incident beam s is the unit vector along the diffracted beam and we have drawn a perpendicular on the plane h k l which goes upwards like this and we chop it at a distance d star h k l which is equal to 1 by d h k l. So, now if you compare the modulus of the vector s minus s 0 that is we consider the modulus of this vector is equal to 2 sin theta and modulus of d star h k l is equal to 1 by d h k l. So, these two conditions if we compare and then if we want to take a ratio of the two equations what we end up is the expression s minus s0 by lambda is equal to d star h k l which is from Bragg's law and this d star h k l can also be written as h a star plus k b star plus l c star where a star b star and c star are unit vectors in the reciprocal space along x y and z. So, when a constructive interference happens the Bragg's law or Bragg's condition is satisfied and then we get a diffraction that is when the vector s minus s0 by lambda coincides with the reciprocal lattice vector d star h k l we observe diffraction. So, from the first law equation we can write a into s minus s 0 as equal to n x lambda equal to a dot d h k l star 
into lambda which is equal to a dot h a star plus k b star plus l c star. lambda. So now we replace nx by h as a dot a star is equal to 1 and a dot b is equal to 0. So similarly we can write n y equal to k and n z equal to l. So this is how one can convert Bragg's law in vector notation and we can write the Bragg's law in vector form as s minus s0 by lambda equal to d star h k l equal to h a star plus k b star plus l c star. So now when we are trying to understand how the scattering of x-rays take place from a crystalline material, we need to understand the phenomena from inside. See when we have periodic arrangement of atoms and we believe that periodic arrangement of atoms are responsible for scattering of x-rays in case of crystals and we have derived Bragg's law and with this understanding it actually means that the electrons present in each element are responsible for scattering of x-rays in case of crystalline materials. And the overall scattering from the crystal is a logical sum of scattering of x-rays by each and every electron in present in that. So the scattering amplitude by a single electron is considered first with the variation of scattering angle and the scattering angle is more easily understood when we do the calculation using sin theta. So in my next representations when we talk about scattering angle we will represent it in terms of sin theta. And then when we have one particular atom having z number of electrons that, that is the atomic number of that particular atom consisting of z number of electrons they have definite power of scattering. That definite power of scattering of each and every atom is called the corresponding atomic scattering factor designated by the lowercase letter f which is actually a logical sum of scattering amplitude from the electrons from all the electrons present in the concerned atom. So what is happening is every electron is responsible for scattering x-rays. And then when we have a set of electrons for one particular atom, all those electrons, the scattering coming from all those electrons are considered to be the scattering power of that particular element. So the atomic scattering factor can be defined as the amplitude scattered by an atom, that is the amplitude of x-ray scattered by an atom divided by the amplitude of x-ray scattered by an electron and it is designated by the lowercase letter f. At zero scattering angle all the scattered waves are in phase and hence the scattered amplitude is the simple sum of contribution of all the electrons that indicates the f is equal to z at theta equal to 0 or sin theta equal to 0. 
But what happens when the scattering angle increases, the phenomena becomes more difficult, more the phenomena becomes different and the scattering of x-rays from these atoms changes significantly with change in the scattering angle. So as the scattering angle increases, f reduces below the value of z due to, due to more and more destructive interferences between z scattered waves. So when we have higher scattering angle, the value of f goes below the value of z due to more and more destructive interferences between the z number of scattered waves from each and every electron. So the plot of this scattering factor f with the scattering angle more significantly we represent it in terms of sin theta by lambda has a characteristic feature which I am going to draw in the next uh, slide. The scattering factor f is represented along y. Remember the scattering factor corresponds to the atomic number z and if we try to plot sin theta by lambda in x axis, remember lambda is represented in angstroms. So 1 by lambda is being represented in angstrom unit, angstrom inverse unit. So the unit along x axis is angstrom inverse and at sin theta, theta equal to 0, sin theta is 0 and theta equal to 90 degree, sin theta is 1 and then 1 by wavelength which is in case of molybdenum can be 0.77 angstrom, in case of copper can be 1.54 angstrom. So depending on the wavelength, this axis will be spanned either below 1 or up to 1. So we can have values like this. Suppose I am plotting it up to 1.1 1 .1 using copper radiation, uh, using molybdenum radiation. So now for oxide ion, O2 minus ion, which has 10 electrons in it, the scattering factor behaves like this. The scattering from this oxide anion reduces very rapidly with respect to sin theta by lambda. If we consider another isoelectronic species which is silicon 4 plus which also has same number of electrons but much more number of protons, the scattering factor falls like this. If we draw the same plot for the inert gas neon which also has 10 electrons so it starts from here and falls like that. All these are starting from z equal to 10. So this nature indicates that the scattering factor for all the atoms with a particular value of z starts from the same point and then deviates in a different way. Why is it like that? In case of Si4+, plus, the nuclear charge is much higher. As a result, it can bound, bind the electrons around it more tightly towards it. As a result, the electrons are more closely associated with the atom itself. Hence, its scattering power does not reduce very fast as it happens in case of oxide where the nuclear charge is much less compared to silicon and as a result, the nuclei, nucleus do not have significant hold on the electrons and the electron cloud for oxide is much more diffused 
compared to the electron cloud around the silicon and hence the scattering power of oxygen falls very rapidly. So this is how the scattering factor changes with the different atoms. Let us see if we have atoms with very much different atomic numbers what happens to the value of f if we try to plot f with sin theta by lambda for different atoms once again in angstrom inverse unit. Most of the organic compounds contain light elements that means carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur etc. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen they have atomic numbers very close 4, 5, 6 etc. So those elements decay very quickly the scattering factor decay very sharp and goes like this. So this I am plotting as light elements. Of course, these curves are going to be slightly different for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and so on. But then if we compare the same with chlorine, which has a larger number of electrons, the plot goes like that. For bromine, it is much higher and diffracts up to much higher angle. And if we have iodine, with a large atomic number, the atomic scattering factor falls like that. So this is how the scattering factor for various atoms varies with the angle of diffraction that is sin theta by lambda and that is why the compounds which has heavier elements, they diffract better at higher angle with in comparison, the compounds which are having only light atoms like organic small organic molecules which are having only carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen, they diffract less. Whereas if you have a bromine or a chlorine or iodine in your molecule, the crystals containing such molecules diffract better because you have a better scattering from the heavier element. So in today's lecture, we understood the representation of Lavey's and Bragg's equations in vector notation. Then we have tried to understand the theory behind scattering of X-rays by different elements. What are the factors that influences the scattering for different elements? And we got to know about a new term called the scattering factor or atomic scattering factor which varies with the scattering angle. So in the next class, we will continue this topic.